David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Friday, July 7th, 2023. Time to discover some cocaine in the world headquarters here or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, apparently yeah, I totally missed this thing. But uh, I saw something in email just like literally seconds before coming on the air, although it, it came through last night. Uh, I guess I'll read it. Because I guess we need to know these things. Uh, but it, it came an email from The Hill with a news alert. White House cocaine discovery becomes GOP political fodder. That sounded interesting. And uh, I had no idea that the White House had discovered cocaine. But uh, congratulations. I understand it's extremely popular. Um, I would have thought that meant it had been discovered earlier. But okay. And uh, maybe they could sell it off and, and put the money in the treasury. I don't know what's going on, and I guess that's the thing. And I, I imagine I mean, it's pretty easy to see now that all of a sudden, I guess, if you have that happen, and I missed that happening, but I guess they, I don't know. I, we'll read the thing. This is what the, I'll read this the full story as the uh, Hill claims it's giving us. It's mostly a story about what the Republicans are doing with the fact that there was I guess cocaine discovered somewhere in in the White House, which I, I don't know if you know this, but there used to be another guy who lived in the White House and he and his son were widely uh, uh, suspected of, uh, well, uh, sometimes using artificial stimulants. So I don't know if they left it behind. But of course, there's the issue of, well, Hunter Biden, too, I guess, has... Uh, uh, you know, had his history with it, but but he doesn't live in the White House. Neither did Donald Trump Jr. live in the White House. So I don't know if it's any more or less likely. But at any rate, I guess they now have to figure out uh, how that got there and who it is. But in the meantime, Republicans will tell you, it's, it's Joe Biden. He's sleepy, but also on cocaine. He's, you know, he, he has no energy, but he's also addicted. Okay, we'll see. And... Uh, We'll see what uh, they have to say about it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll read the story, although Justice has sent me a message here. It used to be when the Secret Service found cocaine, they partied with some prostitutes somewhere. That's right. That's true. The Secret Service, they've been in the White House the whole time. That's certainly true. And I do remember that there were stories that, yeah, sometimes, but although it was usually when they were away from the White House, there was a little bit of cocaine circulating among uh, Secret Service agents, too. So... I don't know. We'll see. I assume the Secret Service is going to do the investigating, so I doubt very much that they'll conclude that it was their cocaine. So we'll see how uh, how this shakes out. But yeah, how you square that with he? You know, he can barely move. He's senile. He has no energy. He's asleep half the time. But he's also on cocaine. I don't know. But none of it has ever made any sense. So let me see what the Hill has to say here. The discovery of cocaine near the West Wing of the White House is causing a political headache for President Biden, leaving him exposed to criticisms from his GOP opponents while raising concerns about security at the complex. I guess so. Administration officials have been fielding uncomfortable questions this week about how cocaine got into the White House. Somebody brought it. That's the answer. Amid a Secret Service investigation into the matter. And it could have been them, so... Meanwhile, media chatter about the discovery is overshadowing what the White House wishes the focus would be on. Instead, glimmers of hope in the economy, NATO and other domestic and foreign issues it sees as far more pressing. Uh, yeah, I would think that would be more pressing. Um, and it's Jobs Friday, Greg reminded us yesterday. I don't usually follow that news all that closely, but I, I did see somebody uh, handing out numbers and saying something, 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 and, you know, lots of new jobs created. And I think it's relatively good news once again. And uh, I think we ought to, we all ought to do some cocaine in celebration of it. I, it's, there's no real reason why. Eh, I don't know. Anyway, let's see. Uh, oh, there's some, well, there's another article about it linked here in the sidebar in the hill, and I'm not certain what it is telling me so maybe we may have to click on that it's going to be it's all cocaine it's cocaine bear in the white house weekend for us all right 
Well, let's see. I'm sure it's incredibly frustrating. There is also the struggle with any White House. No, this is also the struggle with any White House. You plan and you plan and you plan and you have perfect events and the perfect schedule and something unexpected is thrown into the mix. Cocaine. And now <laughs> now it's an Eric Clapton song all of a sudden, but being recited for you. Okay. So at the end of every sentence, we're just going to say cocaine. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Well, if it works, it works. All right. Uh, let's see. This was according to a Democratic strategist and aide in a previous administration where they were finding uh, heroin all over the place. I don't know. It's, it's, it's every administration have its own secretly discovered drug. Uh, the story has been dominating television news. I didn't even realize that. Since the discovery Sunday inside a work area in the West Wing, which led to a precautionary closure of the White House complex. According to administration officials, the Secret Service confirmed Wednesday the substance was cocaine. Ah, I see. Like, why would it close? So, uh, hey, we found some cocaine. Everybody close the place up. Let's all have a party. No, I guess if they discovered it on Sunday and they didn't uh, confirm that it was cocaine until Wednesday, they probably shut down the complex because it was a mysterious white powder between Sunday and Wednesday. Uh, all right. White House Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre spent much of that day's briefing fielding question after question about the discovery with few additional details to share other than the Secret Service would, quote, get to the bottom of this. Conservative media, however, opted to associate the cocaine found in the pres with the president's uh, or associate the cocaine found to the president's son, Hunter Biden, which has, uh, who has, well, I, I must be, I feel like I'm on cocaine here. Actually, I don't know, but you know, why not? Uh, I'm not reading very well, and I don't know whether, maybe cocaine sharpens your reading skills. I have no idea. Anyway, uh, Hunt, they wanted to connect it to Hunter Biden because, of course, his history of drug use, despite there being no such links, and the fact that neither Hunter nor Joe Biden were at the White House that day. And uh, as you know, uh, cocaine is one of those things that just materializes on the day it is used and it can never be left behind or has no, I don't know, yeah, I'm not certain what that's supposed to mean. President Trump, meanwhile, lashed out at the media for its coverage and questioned, does anybody really believe that the, all caps, cocaine found in the West Wing of the White House, very close to the Oval Office, is for the use of anyone other than Hunter and Joe Biden? Yes, I believe that. One source close to the administration, however, said it was handling the situation very well. It's all political fodder right now. Political, uh, well, where's Greg for that one? That's bullshit. That's right. Uh, okay. I think it's comical. Of course, you're going to do what you need to do anytime the opposition has a way to lean in and provide some type of antidote or response that's going to get people wired up like cocaine. They're going to do so, the source added. All right. When asked about Trump's comments, the White House hammered into the president's top political rival. I have noticed that there does seem to be some increasing frustration coming from that corner in general. Oh, boy, boy, they hammered the, they sure hammered him. Um, let's see. It's probably rooted in the contrast between their substantive policy efforts said White House spokesman Andrew Bates. There's a long list of areas where this administration succeeded for the middle class where our predecessors did not, probably due to all the cocaine. Uh, let's see. They tried to bring the conversation back to Bidenomics, but didn't seem to work. And questions came as the president was headed to South Carolina for a speech on the economy and his investments in clean energy. On Wednesday, the president met with Swedish Prime Minister oh, uh, Ulf Christensen at the White House in a show of support for Sweden joining NATO by the deadline of the summit next week. But the news cycle stayed hooked on the cocaine story, as so many other people did. Um, hmm. All right, well, it's in the hands of the Secret Service, yada, yada. I don't know. I don't know how much more uh, I care to read about it. I want to look at the other linked story. Uh, it was noted here that went on Wednesday by uh, the press secretary, Jean-Pierre, who said that the drugs were found in a highly traveled area of the White House, and that the president and his family, including Hunter Biden, were at Camp David at the time. But even uh, by Thursday, drawing such a conclusion kept the chatter going. Oh, my gosh, this goes on and on. There's more. They quote some, uh, I guess they felt the need to ask some Republican senators, what do you think of finding cocaine in the White House? Why, it's horrible. 
Uh, what about you, Democratic representative? Why it's horrible, but it's not what you think. And uh, I don't know. They really have put an awful lot into uh, making a long story out of this. Um, I wanted to click on this one here. So, McEnany breaks with Trump. No way cocaine at White House, dot, dot, dot. Ellipsis, it trails off. So I'm sort of curious. All right. McEnany breaks with Trump. No way cocaine at White House is Hunter Biden's. That is an interesting break. Why did she do it? We are talking about former White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany, who threw cold water on the suggestion that the cocaine found at the White House over the holiday weekend could have belonged to Hunter Biden, the president's son. For it to be Hunter Biden, he left on Friday. He was at Camp David. There is no way it is inconceivable to think cocaine could sit for a 72-hour period at the White House. So, <laughs> because <laughs> nobody's going to let that cocaine go to waste for 72 hours. I don't know what the, they ever did it in our administration. I don't know. I mean, I just don't... I, I don't know where it was found. Like if it was found in, uh, you know, a potted uh, a ficus tree or something, like the guy dropped it, somebody, whoever, the cocaine guy, <laughs> whoever that might be, dropped it and doesn't realize it. And, you know, and you also, you don't call the switchboard. Did you find any cocaine? I dropped some cocaine in the White House. And if anybody found it, that's mine. Call me, 1-800-COCAINE-GUY. I, uh, I'm i not sure why it, I mean, I don't need to be doing this. I don't need to be doing this. <laughs> Screw all of you. I, I, I don't mean, to, I'm not, def I don't, I honestly, it, without looking at it like defending Hunter Biden or accusing Hunter Biden or anything about anybody in particular, I don't see why cocaine couldn't have been lost there and then not discovered by anybody for several days. Like the idea that it was discovered on a day when such and such a suspect wasn't there. Like, is there video of the cocaine being dropped? Then you know whose cocaine it was. I, I don't see why. Uh, I, I guess I get what Kaylee McEnany is saying is that it's a pretty thoroughly monitored re uh, 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 building, residence, the uh, whole area. I guess the job of the Secret Service, in part, is to keep a close eye on what the hell is around in this building. And it seems like, it's, a, I think, a fair thing to say, it wouldn't have escaped notice for all that long. So maybe. I'm just curious as to why she even bothers ruling this out. I guess it's because she is a Fox News host and she needed to fill time on on the air, like me. And just said, uh, all right, well, I think it's probably unlikely. Um, I don't think that's going to ingratiate her with any uh, MAGA types, but I don't think they're going to notice either. I think they're just going to blow right past it. So, okay, I think all in all, probably a uh, a less than important angle on the story. But I guess we have to note that, all right, there was some cocaine found, and now we all have to hear about cocaine for the next two weeks. Uh, let's see. Justice says, my money is on Peter Ducey putting the dime bag in the cubby. It was put in a cubby where visitors put their cell phones, etc. Oh, interesting. So uh, when you turn in your cell phone, when you're visiting the White House, you empty your pockets and put stuff in a cubby. Is, are they open cubbies? Are they, do they have little doors on them? Are they little lockers? I don't know. It's interesting. Like empty your pockets, take out your cell phone and keys and stuff. And I mean, like, do you, I, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I guess I'd be like, uh, oh, I should have left this cocaine at home. Yeah, I really shouldn't take this. But, but, you know, you think that's dumb, but I will remind you that, oh, I don't know. Uh, I forget the numbers now, but uh, several thousand people a year show up at United States airports with guns in their luggage, their carry-ons, and are shocked to find that the TSA is finding these guns on them. And they always say, ah, I forgot that was in there. So, I mean, I imagine you, for, uh, plus also you're high, maybe. Uh, so, but, but, you know, if you're wondering about the, uh, the wisdom of it all, or who brings cocaine with them to the White House? And then if you have it with you, who puts it in the locker? But I don't know. I mean, do they have drug sniffing dogs? And you figure, well, uh, they're going to put me through a metal detector. If the dog smells the cocaine on me, then I don't know. I, 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 
just oh i just i'm not at the white house that often i guess i should say and i don't really know what you do and don't bring maybe that's a thing like a housewarming gift right you never go over to somebody's party or something right you've been invited over to the house bring a bottle of wine is that really so different from cocaine i don't know i don't think so anyway let's see some more notes from justice here administration officials are able to offer tours of parts of the west wing to friends and family members People who are not members of staff must leave electronics and cocaine in the storage cubicles before taking a tour. I guess that's a quote out of this report from Reuters. What I'm really interested in now is um, whether those cubbies are open things or they have little doors on them. And like, what would motivate somebody who says, I'm taking a tour? <laughs> One, oh. Uh, I'm going on a tour, a private tour of the White House. A staffer is going to take me. I should bring some cocaine. But then getting to the West Wing and saying, no, really not. I should leave it here. As I'm just kind of curious. Like, I guess if I'm carrying cocaine and I'm thinking I better take this cocaine out of my pocket temporarily and put it in a cubby, I'm more inclined to do so if it's got a little door and I think the things will be private rather than just saying open cubby. Let me just put this cocaine here. Uh, and then, of course, to not go back for it, which, uh, you know, maybe that's a drug thing. You get all paranoid. I better not go back. Did they go back and get their cell phone and just be like, I'll take the phone, fo- take the phone, leave the cocaine. Right. Isn't that from the uh, the Godfather? That's exactly what they did. And from now, on, I'm, I'm going everywhere with a cannoli, a box of cannoli. And uh, all right. Well, let's see. Biden and his family is another quote from the article. Thank you, Justice, for reading this so that I don't have to. Biden and his family returned to the White House early on Thursday after spending the holiday weekend at the presidential retreat at Camp David, where they left a pile of, uh, give me another drug. I need something else. I'm running out of good drugs to leave people. All right. Bales of of Mexican marijuana were found there. Uh, Family members who visit the Bidens traditionally enter and exit through the East Wing, sources said. Aha. So the uh, West Wing is where all the cokeheads go. It's very hot. And it's like the Studio 54 of of the White House, I guess. I don't know. All right. Well, very retro of them, and that's hot. So great news for that. And also the best news is that now cocaine is a social media service, and everybody should sign up for it this week and uh, be on the new thing. And uh, and I don't know what else. All right. Well, I'm tired. The other thing I was talking about before getting on the show My brother Mark wondering whether I was on threads yet. And the answer is no, not yet. But it might make some sense to sign up there so that nobody else signs up there as me and then starts doing crazy things like saying, I left the cocaine in the White House. Sorry, my fault. So for security purposes, it might make some sense to do that. And of course, Scott has been suggesting for, well, it's it's now getting around to some time now that I... Uh, experiment with Instagram for using it for promotion of the show. All a very good idea. The, the cocaine, not a great idea, but the rest of the things a pretty good idea. I don't know. I don't feel like signing up for any new services now. I just don't. I feel like I just did the Mastodon thing and I'm afraid like every week there's going to be a new alternative. And I guess I'm sort of waiting for one to become the place where everybody ends up. Although I also see A lot of talk about, and I don't really understand the mechanics of it, but the threads may be connected, you know, federated with the larger, I think people call it Fediverse, but, you know, that includes Mastodon and a number of other linked services, and I don't really understand the architecture of it. But if threads is somehow connected and reachable and readable, what people that I would normally want to follow on threads is readable through Mastodon. Maybe I can just continue to do that. I don't know. We'll see how it shakes out. Uh, you know, I do miss what was on Twitter way before um, Elon Musk bought it. But not that badly yet. Although, anyway, I'm also reliably informed. Mark tells me that if I have a Facebook account, and I do regrettably have a Facebook account, I don't use it for anything. I go on once a year to reply to the people who still use Facebook who who. Facebook tells them it's my birthday 
and then they say happy birthday and I feel like I should say thank you. So I do actually type that usually. My I don't know. My, my only messaging through Facebook is usually me saying this is my once annual visit to Facebook to thank people who use Facebook all the time for telling me happy birthday there. So anyway, uh but he tells me that if you have a Facebook account at all, even if you don't, you don't know it, but you have an Instagram account, you just have to activate it. So I guess if I already have an Instagram account, well, that uh, that removes one obstacle to joining threads, I guess. And uh, although it is not currently the case that you will also automatically have a threads account, probably by next week, uh, Mark Zuckerberg will realize how much he can boost the numbers of uh, that he can report to the, the news outlets about people joining threads if he just gives everybody an account who's on Facebook. And now they have a billion people on threads. And uh, that may be how we get around it. If they also had cocaine, you know, it would be a different story. I'd probably be there already. So, you know, you might as well try it. I don't know. In about 10 years, it'll be easy to do that too. They have marijuana dispensaries now. I imagine they'll have cocaine dispensaries shortly as well. How fantastic for all of us, really. Uh, we're living in the future. It wasn't flying cars so much that you were actually going to get. It's just the feeling of flying while you're driving in your car between White House cocaine dispensaries. Ah, okay. Well, now we're caught up with what crazy Republicans are saying about that. And there's more. They're saying other crazy things. And a lot of them are in pocket. And I should start sharing them sooner rather than later. Or we're going to run out of time. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I put all the cocaine stories away. Right. Check. Uh, Marjorie Trader Green. Murdery Trader Green. Here's the news on her. She has been kicked out of the Freedom Caucus. Not enough cocaine, apparently. And uh, she had to go back and get some more. That's probably uh, required for entry. Green ousted from Freedom Caucus, board member says. We're back with the Hill again. They're dominating today's program. <laughs> Uh, oh, I've forgotten to credit all of the the uh, individual writers who were responsible for all the cocaine stories, but we'll just say the cocaine bear wrote them all. If you give a bear uh, enough cocaine and enough typewriters, eventually they'll be uh, hired by the Hill, I think, is what that, that so it goes something like this. The Hardline House Freedom Caucus. Hard line? Oh, boy, it's a cocaine line, House Freedom Caucus, has voted to remove Representative Murdery Trader Green from its ranks, according to Cocaine Andy Harris. That's what I'm going to start calling him from now on. I don't know whether there's any basis for it, but you can't stop me. Uh, he, of course, a, a Freedom Caucus board member. Everybody knows that. A vote was taken to remove Murdery Trader Green from the House Freedom Caucus for some of the things she's done, Harris told Politico and CNN on Thursday. And he did actually call her Murdery Trader Green because he's on so much cocaine. A spokesperson for the House Freedom Caucus, HFC, uh, uh, holy effing cocaine, I think is what that stands for, uh, would not confirm whether the group voted to remove Green that's interesting. Pointing to its policy of confidentiality. We, we did it by dictate. I don't know. I imagine they must have voted, but, but we won't tell you. We neither confirm nor deny the existence of the vote. HFC, not KFC, but HFC, does not comment on membership or internal process, they said, because they're very secretive. KFC also does not comment on it because the 11 herbs and spices are a secret, as you know. In a statement responding to news, Green did not directly address her membership status in the House Freedom Caucus. In Congress, I serve Northwest Georgia first and serve no group in Washington. <clears throat> and then she cleared her throat just like that. My America First credentials, guided by my Christian faith, are forged in steel, seared into my character and will never change, she said, except when I'm disavowing QAnon. I fight every single day in the halls of Congress. That's true. Usually with Lauren Boebert. Against the hate America Democrats who are <laughs> trying to destroy this country. It's just funny to see her uh, turn. The, the, you just got, you know, murder of Trader Green. You just got kicked out of the House Freedom Caucus. What's happening next? You know, she can't go to Disney World because they're pedophiles. So, you know, what does she have to say? Well, all I can tell you is I'm not beholden to any group. 
Also, the hate America Democrats are the worst people in the world and they're vampires and... All right. I will work with anyone in capital letters, except for hate American Democrats, of course, who wants to secure our border, protect our children inside the womb and after they are born. Uh, And it's nice they add that now. End the forever foreign wars and do the work to save this country. Uh, By the way, yeah, you don't have to climb inside the womb to protect children. I think that's a little too intimate. The GOP has less than two years to show America... What a strong, unified, Republican-led Congress will do when President Trump wins the White House in 2024. This is my focus, nothing else, Green concluded. Asked if Green is now formally out of the group, Harris said, as far as I know, that is the way it is. The vote to remove Green, which they denied having, uh, comes after she broke with many of her colleagues in supporting the debt bill deal that Kevin McCarthy struck with Joe Biden. Uh, Let's see. She has become a close ally of McCarthy, supporting him for speaker, even as opposition for many of her Freedom Caucus colleagues forced a historic 15 ballot election in January. I think all of that mattered, Harris said, referring to the debt bill and Green's support for McCarthy. But it was Green's latest clash with fellow firebrand Representative Lauren Boebert that appears to have pushed members to vote to remove her, with Harris calling it the straw that broke the camel's back. All right. That is interesting. Green called Bobert a, quote, little bitch on the House floor in late June and publicly confirmed doing so after Bobert made a surprise move to force action on her articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Green criticized Bobert for not coming to explain her decision to the House GOP conference and accused Bobert of copying, you copied me, copying her articles of impeachment against Mayorkas. I think the way she referred to a fellow member was probably not the way we expect our members to refer to their fellow, especially female male members, Harris said. And the vote first reported by Politico last week took place on the morning before the two-week recess ahead of Independence Day. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, KGRO in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you sent donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sense or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. Whoop, come on, button. There we go. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, the show's back on, and I was fighting with the mute button. I had a weird angle on it. And All right, well, uh, I should get some uh, cocaine so that I can press it more energetically, I guess. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, by the way, some comments. Uh, Mighty OCD chiming in. Uh, oh, look at this. Look, I got a clean bill of health on this one. Never has it been more evident that k X has never done illicit drugs, LMAO. Uh well, okay. Let's keep it that way, shall we? And uh, let's see. Some kid was on the tour, he also suggests. Uh, some kid was on the tour with his folks and forgot that he had a corner of a baggie with a tiny amount of Coke and he ditched it. Uh, that's a possibility, right? Either that or a reporter did it where they found it. It's a joke. Okay, so I guess that's another thing. They don't. I did see that nowhere in the reporting did they actually talk about the the uh, volume that was involved. So, you know, I, I mean, I guess it could be a trace amount in a baggie. Yeah, I mean, I guess somebody's on the tour or whatever and they just take everything out of their pocket and they're like, well, there's nothing in it. Nobody's going to look at it and go, what's in this, you know, what's this trace of this powder in a baggie? But I mean, 
Yes, they are. <laughs> it's the White House. So anyway, uh, not wise. And I guess there's probably video surveillance and they'll figure it out who it is. Although, see the person, whether they know who the hell that person is, um, I, I have no idea. Okay, let's see. Um, where were we? Oh, yeah, you know what? There was a little bit more to Murder Retreater Green getting kicked out of the Freedom Caucus. I thought I was going to leave it there. Uh, now that they've confirmed that, I, I assume we can guess that there was a vote on it. I did think it was actually interesting that, um, yeah, there are some repercussions, I guess, to having all those fights with everybody. And uh, it, it's interesting that there are limitations, even for House Freedom Caucus wackadoodles. There's, uh, at the very least, you can look at this and say, um, yes, even those weirdos and those lunatics are realizing it can't stand being around Marjorie Trader Green. She's just horrible. She's a pain in the ass. She's a loud mouth. She never stops. She's always pushing everybody's buttons. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to get elected that way by attacking Democrats all the time. But I mean, she's just vicious and horrible as a person, even to other Republicans, and they just can't take it anymore. So, you know, I think that's interesting all by itself. Whether it diminishes her standing or power has yet to be seen, but uh, you got to uh, assume so. I mean, at some point, I don't know, is, is Kevin McCarthy smart enough for this to say, well, you're a horrible person and you have no skills whatsoever, but you apparently have some connections to the wackadoodle corners of the Freedom Caucus, etc. So... Uh, the fact that you've agreed to sign on as a supporter of mine in the speakership and uh, in leadership is good. I need you as a liaison to these idiots. Now these idiots say we hate her and we don't want anything to do with her. Does Kevin McCarthy say, what do I need murdery trader green for? She's always been a liability, but you know, or the benefits outweighed the, the drawbacks because she could talk to the lunatics for me. Now she can't, she wasn't doing very well with him. She didn't convince any of them. I guess she convinced enough of them eventually to vote for him to make him speaker. But she's unable to make them do anything else. And now they've had a vote. We hate her. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that leaves her out in the cold with McCarthy at all. Or whether McCarthy, he's also, you know, dumb enough to say, well, she's been loyal to me, so I'll keep her close. But to what end? You got to be a little more practical about things than that, Kevin. And also, stop leaving cocaine in the White House. Jeez, cut it out. Let's see. Uh, but there was more to this article. And, uh, well, I'll skip this part. But uh, it does say here, the most pressing battle between members of the House Freedom Caucus and House GOP leadership over is over appropriations and spending levels. Last month, a portion of members from the group and their allies blocked legislative activity on the House floor for a week in protest of top-line spending levels set in the debt limit bill. Members of the group have regularly met with leadership about spending levels in the week since, but they left for the two-week break with disagreements remaining and cocaine in their pockets. Beyond the spending levels, members of the Freedom Caucus caused more headaches for leadership with privileged motions to force action on their measures, in addition to Boebert's move to force action on Mayorkas impeachment articles, which were ultimately referred back to committees. Uh, Representative Anna Paulina Luna forced action on a resolution to censure Representative Adam Schiff over his statements about former President Trump. Okay, so they've done something twice now, and... Uh, now they're experts. So there you have it. I don't know. I guess I added a little bit. Just a reminder of what the tensions are and that, you know, actually something serious will be at stake later on when they have to finish these appropriations bills. And if they don't get them done, remember, if they don't get them done by October 1st, we have a partial government shutdown. But if they don't get them done by January 1st, their own self-imposed thing, there are across the board budget cuts in the offing. So... You want to keep an eye on those things. All right, let's see. Other things that I had in pocket um, in no particular order and uh, of no particular importance. We'll say this. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll uh, throw things back to the social media wars as our uh, longtime friend and listener, uh, Montreal girl, 
is how we're uh, pronouncing the uh, the vowel-less contraction of her username and the username by which we know her from Bird Sight Days, who says, uh, who, who A, is uh, obviously Canadian and or could just have a great affinity for Canada, but is in fact Canadian, sends us Canadian news from, well, BBC coverage of news from out of Canada. Canada stops advertising with Facebook and Instagram in news row, as they say in BBC News. When you Otherwise, I say row, but I see it's coming from BBC News. And of course, in context, I know what they're talking about. Uh, all right. What's, what's the story? Why did they do it? Well, let me tell you, uh, she linked to it. So now I can read that to you if the buttons uh, will oblige. Canada stops advertising with Facebook and Instagram in News Row. And here's a picture of Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez, the Canadian Heritage Minister, presumably. Um, though you might guess, uh, well, let's say he's NAFTA related and his name is Pablo Rodriguez. You'd probably guess he was the the Heritage Minister of Mexico, but you'd be wrong. Uh, there's a lot of sharing of cultures all across our greater NAFTA family. And he's the Heritage Minister of Canada. He said his government, the one he belongs to, will pull the equivalent of 10 million Canadian dollars worth of advertising from Meta. How do you like that? Uh, let's see. Nadine Youssef reporting this for BBC News Toronto. Uh, Canada's federal government said it will pull all of its advertising from Facebook and Instagram. A, that's the way they said it. It follows parent company Meta's move to restrict news content for Canadians after Parliament passed a law that will force tech firms to pay media for news. No, oh, this is interesting. Okay. Uh, I knew she sent it to us for a good reason, and interestingness was that reason. Interestingness, okay, interest. But Canadian officials said on Wednesday that they stand by the law and will not be intimidated by Meta. They said they have been in contact with other countries who plan to pass similar laws. So doing a little Euro thing here. Are the Canadians good? Uh, Google has also announced plans to block Canadian news in the country in response to the Online News Act, also known as Bill C-18, when it takes effect in about six months. So that's uh, that's actually quite disturbing, the idea that Meta and Google will block Canadian news in Canada? Like, ha what? How? I, I better unravel this. But Canadian officials say they are hopeful that they can successfully negotiate a deal with Google's parent company, Alphabet, oh yeah, that will prevent the block from going ahead. Google's concerns can be met by what we plan to do in the law's regulations, said Minister of Heritage Pablo Rodriguez at a news conference on Wednesday. On the other hand, Mr. Rodriguez said Meta has not been engaging with the government in the same way on a path forward. Meta are not talking to us. Very British in that. Meta are not talking to us. Adding, their decision to block news for Canadians is unreasonable and irresponsible. Mr. Rodriguez estimates that Canada's decision to pull all advertising on Meta's platform will cost the tech giant that was 10 million Canadian dollars. That is 7.5, well, 7.54 million American. Uh, or if you're listening in Britain, uh, Get yourself a calculator. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, okay, I'll do the conversion for you. 5.93 million pounds. Okay, is everybody uh, now uh, up to speed on this? All right. He did not say whether the advertising pull would apply to Meta's new platform threads <laughs> to bring it back around to that. That's true. He really, it's really in here. I'm not making that up. Which is scheduled to debut on Thursday as a rival to Twitter. But Mr. Rodriguez said Canada's move in theory would apply to all platforms under the parent company. The loss of government advertising is a drop in the bucket for Meta, whose annual revenue in 2022 was over $116 billion. But Mr. Rodriguez said Canada is determined to send a message that it will not be intimidated. He added he hopes it will inspire others, including Canadian companies, to do the same. Media firms, uh, uh, -oh. uh, Quebec, Quebec or maybe Quebec or are Quebec or I don't know. And Cosijo, Co G 
Jiso, Kojeko. What is this? K, a K. It's not even a K. It's a C. C O G E C O. I don't know. Canadians can tell me. Both based in the province of Quebec said they will also be pulling advertisements from Meta. That's good. Congratulations to those two companies whose names are printed here. In a statement to the BBC, Meta said that Bill C-18 is flawed legislation that ignores the realities of how our platforms work. Maybe. That's been known to happen in legislation. Publishers actively choose to post on Facebook and Instagram because it benefits them to do so. So as I understood what the law was, they said that uh, uh, these media giants like Google and Facebook would have to pay the media outlets for the news like if they put up their but if, if they if the news companies post their news and offer it to them for free i guess from meta and google's perspective they're like well, what am i supposed to, why do i have to pay them for that we have a bulletin board and they chose to post some news on it we don't have to pay them for that content but um it's an interesting view of things and i'd love to see if it works out anyway uh Let's see. The federal government says the bill is necessary to allow struggling news organizations to, quote, secure fair compensation for news and links shared on the tech platforms. I mean, I understand that from that perspective. It sounds like the germ of a good idea. Anyway, we'll see whether they can make anything out of it. Similar law to Bill C-18 was passed in Australia in 2021, but it was tweaked after Meta briefly blocked users in the country from sharing or viewing news on its platform. The blackout ended when the amendments were made, and Google and Meta have since negotiated more than 30 deals with Australian media companies. And, you know, they really ought to be forced once in a while to negotiate with Western democratic governments about things like this, since they are frequently forced to censor the news if they want to be able to participate in the Chinese market. So they give in to the government when it's China, uh, but make no allowances for Western governments, and maybe it's about time that the Western governments flexed a little with them too. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he believes Canada has become a global test case for laws like C8, Bill C-18. This is what they want to do, make an example of us, said Mr. Trudeau of tech giants like Meta. Facebook decided that Canada is a small enough country that they could reject our asks, he said. They made the wrong choice by deciding to attack Canada. And, uh, yeah, they probably shouldn't be taking on national governments that way um, when they're in the business of surrendering to them when when it's China. Anyway, but China, a market and a country too big for them to ignore. And Trudeau's point here is that they think they can ignore the Canadian market. And I guess we'll find out. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez said Canada has been discussing its law with other countries looking to pass similar legislation like the UK, Indonesia, and Brazil. Canada has also seen support from some U.S. senators and pundits. An opinion piece in the L.A. Times by columnist Brian Merchant on Wednesday said Canada absolutely must not give in to the tech giant's tantrum. Uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, who's leading the push for similar bill in Washington, D.C., what do you know, has also spoken up in support of Canada's law. Meta has already begun restricting access to news to a small percentage of Canadians in tests and said it plans to implement a full blackout in the coming weeks. They should just give Elon Musk control over the news operation and it'll probably black itself out sooner or later. Um, Let's see. On Instagram, some users have reported seeing a message that reads, in response to Canadian government legislation, news content can't be viewed in Canada while trying to view news content. And we'll see whether that actually works out. And, uh, hmm, let's see. And, uh, well, we'll keep an eye on that one. Thanks to Montreal Girl for pointing that out to us. How did you get the news that that was happening? Aha! Right, okay, so we'll never know. Okay, uh, so that's it for our international news segment, I guess. Unless... Something else comes up. Aha! Oh, no, here is some international news that I put away yesterday and thought I should mention yesterday, but I got tied up in... What did we do yesterday? I don't even remember. Here's some international news, and it's opening the story because I'm not Canadian. Uh, NBC News has, or I have grabbed NBC News' reporting of this one. The Wagner mercenary chief. What's his name again? 
uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. He is still in Russia, despite a deal to A, end his mutiny, and B, land him in Belarus. This according to Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, who gave a rare news conference and said, uh, yeah, Prigozhin's still in St. Petersburg, more as far as I know, more than a week after the armed rebellion. So if true, that's sort of an interesting development all by itself. This, uh, oh, let's see, who wrote this? Keir Simmons, Matthew Bodner, and Alexander Smith, uh, datelined Minsk, Belarus. The mystery surrounding the fate of Russia's rebellious Wagner group deepened Thursday after the president of Belarus said the mercenary fighters and their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, were not in his country, even though the Kremlin said they had been effectively exiled there after having marched on Moscow. Maybe they just are. They're in St. Petersburg, but they're not allowed to read news. Alexander Lukashenko held court in a rare hours-long news conference Thursday morning, having summoned the world's media, including NBC News, that's the people writing here, to his presidential palace in Minsk. Speaking a little more than a week since the armed mutiny, in which he emerged as a surprise central figure, Lukashenko also dismissed concerns about his offer to eventually host the mercenaries on his territory. He also shared new details about the tension on the day, uh, saying up to seven Russian military aircraft were dispatched to Belarus to transport troops to defend Moscow. Uh Uh-huh. They had to grab up some troops. Uh, All right. The comments raised new questions about how the unprecedented challenge to President Vladimir Putin's rule was resolved. Prigozhin threw Russia into turmoil when he launched his mutiny against the Kremlin's military leaders, but he suddenly backed down after Lukashenko appeared to broker a deal in which Prigozhin and his fighters would leave Russia for its neighboring ally. Lukashenko said last week that Prigozhin was in Belarus. On Thursday, however, he said Prigozhin was in Russia, in his hometown, St. Petersburg, despite the Kremlin's effectively saying he had been banished. His mercenaries were still in their permanent camps, in Russian-controlled territory, Lukashenko added, saying he was still waiting for the Kremlin to ask him to host the fighters. Prigozhin has not been seen publicly since the short-lived mutiny, Uh and NBC News could not confirm his whereabouts. Overnight, a Russian state TV channel, Russia 24, aired a report describing Prigozhin's mutiny as planned, and it appeared to try to discredit him with details of his criminal past. Oh my goodness, no one will be uh, uh, able to believe that. Okay. It also depicted his children as privileged, enjoying parties. Uh, hmm. Okay. NBC News did not confirm the reports. That's a That was a blunt end to the sentence. It depicted his children as privileged, enjoying parties. It's not even punctuated. So I think they... Missed something in the editorial process there. The coverage is a sudden change from the previous scrutiny on state TV, which tended to laud Prigozhin as a war hero. Uh, Rebellion will do that, I guess. The coverage, uh, oh yes, another Russian news organization, Izvestia, has published pictures it said were from a police raid on Prigozhin's house with fake passports, dollar piles of bills, piles of dollar bills perhaps, and gold bars. Very sexy. Lukashenko and Prigozhin's fate is now in Putin's hands. You have to understand that Putin knows Prigozhin much better than I do, Lukashenko said. Putin is much more familiar with him, even from time in St. Petersburg when they lived and worked there. They had very good relations with each other, maybe even more than good. I don't know if you should have said that. (laughs) But, uh, all right, let's see. Uh, Here's some pictures, I guess, from the raid. I don't see any gold bars or dollar bills. But lots of guns, but that's to be expected. It's a mercenary army. And I don't know, are these dollar bills? I can't quite tell. There's some wrapped up bricks of something in in some carrying cases. Who knows? Could be anything. Could be ammunition. Uh, some, all right, you know, nothing really telling here. Uh, afterward, Putin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters in Moscow that the Kremlin was not keeping tabs on Prigozhin. I, I don't believe that for a minute. We don't track his movements, he said. We neither have the means nor the desire to do it. Okay. 
As the mutiny initially gathered pace, a visibly angry Putin made a televised address condemning Wagner leaders as traitors who had stabbed Russia in the back, only to make an accord with the group hours later. I think I'll exit the reading at this point, but kind of interesting that no one knows exactly where he is, and I don't know whether he's going to fall out a window anytime soon, but a little bit of a mystery. If the whole thing was diffused by the idea of his taking exile in Belarus and he hasn't gone, uh, I don't know. We'll see what that means, but I thought everybody should be aware of it. And maybe that's the end of our international reporting uh, corner for the day, except that I forget whether there's also some other things. Eh, you know what? There are some other things. I'm, now I'm scrolling around and saying, well, you know, maybe I should look for other international news and cover all of that. Um, where did this come from? Why do I have this? This was of interest, but did somebody refer? I usually will pocket it when somebody makes a reference, um, but I don't see anything put aside. So maybe I just discovered it uh, on my own on Mastodon here. Uh, this, the a tweet thread from Chris O underscore wiki at Mastodon. Uh, Chris O has put together this interesting thread on the Russian mafia. I thought this was an interesting statement and it grabbed my attention with this picture of this highly tattooed Russian mafia torso here. Uh, Apparently still living torso. It's not a dismembered torso, but uh, I guess they didn't put his face in the picture because Russian mafia guy. So anyway, what is Chris saying here? The Russian mafia has become a silent partner in Russia's war effort in another indication of how close the state and the criminal underworld have become. They are one and the same, of course, in in my view. An analysis shows how high-profile gangsters have fought and, in some cases, died in Ukraine. And I thought that was of some interest to actually remind ourselves of that, uh, well, we'll say, alleged fact. Uh, Polygon Media reports that senior figures among Russia's Vori, V-O-R-Y, is that how they say it? It's criminal elite, that is, have lent their support to Russia's war in Ukraine. This is a major change in attitude for the Vori, who are traditionally anti-authority. And that's easy enough to understand. Usually it's the authorities prosecuting them. They don't usually have a, you know, a good close relationship. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, But it's also like a tenuous alliance to make if your war effort relies on people who could kind of at any minute any disagreement they have with you they'll they're they're not only inclined to say but are also capable of standing apart from the government and saying we're just not going to do this thing the way they say we're going to go our own direction and when there's a war uh in the balance uh, it's interesting i mean it's i guess it could be viewed as a sign of of Putin's strength in the mafia, in the underworld, but his weakness as a government in that he's, you know, these are the allies he has to choose for himself. And this is the war is being conducted by recruiting outsiders, but not just outsiders, like people who are outside of the law being recruited, not just mercenaries, criminals. Anyway, influential members authorities, that is, uh, as they call them, of at least 10 criminal gangs have died in the war, as this map shows. And there is a map, and it does show it, and it identifies their names and, I guess, uh, which uh, or criminal organization they're affiliated with and uh, on the map showing where they died. They include men who have been convicted of robbery, extortion, and murder, and in some cases were serving decades-long prison sentences. When the Wagner Group began recruiting prisoners, the criminal elite, the thieves-in-law, I guess as they call themselves, or Vor Vizekone, I'm not certain of the pronunciation of that, they were initially hostile due to traditional antagonistic relationships between the Vori and state authorities. Attitudes changed after Chakro Molodogo, I don't know what I'm reading here when it comes to the uh, name, right? Yes, no? Uh, So after Chakro Molodogo, and then parentheses, Zakhar Kalashov, 
I don't know what that's supposed to mean. If one his real name and one his gang name and which one is which, I don't know. But he's the most senior Vore currently imprisoned. Uh, the attitudes changed after he urged convicts to join Wagner. His appeal was broadcast on prison TV in the Kostroma, Vladimir, Magadan, and uh, Novo Sibirsk regions immediately after Putin's New Year's address. I mean, this is a very weird thing and all. First of all, prison TV uh, as a network, like prison to prison <laughs> TV. It's one thing. I understand they provide television in prisons, even here in the United States, but that's just sort of an odd situation. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a, another weird dynamic, right? Uh, they need fighters for the war. They turn to the, the mercenary group, Wagner. Wagner, though, says, we want to use our connections to the government to get permission, I guess, to recruit from the prisons. And we want their help in their agreement in releasing these prisoners to do the fighting for us slash them. Uh, but in order to do that, right, the, the, um, the recruiting into prison is not particularly fruitful because you're recruiting from among organized crime members who are historically antagonistic with the government. And you're basically being asked to go and fight for the government. But there's this other layer. Wink, wink. You're really fighting for another organized crime lord. It's sort of interesting uh, that it would all work itself out this way. Uh, let me read on as we head into our top of the hour break. Olga Romanova of the Russia Behind Bars Prisoners' Rights Group says, Thieves' traditions have absolutely changed under Putin, and thanks to him, in his 20 years, prisons are no longer divided into red, run by the Federal Penitentiary Service, and black, run by the thieves themselves. That is, to say, I guess, the, the uh, I don't know whether that's our uh, organized crime gang members who are in prison who, you know, run things in there because uh, they're, a they're able to, or whether they're actually, I mean, are they private prisons actually run by contractors who are oligarchs slash organized crime figures? Very difficult to figure out for me, not having studied this stuff. But uh, very interesting international dynamic to it. I'm going to continue reading this thread after this. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Okay, let's see, where were we? Oh, by the way, news update from Brian Monroe, uh, senior NAFTA correspondent, I guess we'll call him, because, of course, uh, Canadian now... Uh, are you? I mean, are you? I assume you're still Canadian citizen, but now living in Mexico. Are you going to seek Mexican citizenship, Brian? Permanently resettled in Mexico, and uh, quite a move. Skips right over the United States. What? We weren't good enough for you. I can understand why. All right. Anyway, enjoying the high life in Mexico. Who tells me, as a Canadian, uh, still that uh, the pronunciation of the companies that we talked about in the BBC story. Uh, there's Quebec Corps. Uh, that's how you would pronounce that one. And they are a media company. And Cogeco, is that or Cogeco is the G, the hard G, Cogeco, is an ISP in Canada. So mystery solved. Now, where did the cocaine come from, Brian? See if you can solve that one. All right. Jumping back to the uh, weird connections between uh, organized crime and mercenary armies and regular armies and governments in Russia. Uh, interesting. So thieves traditions, we were told by this Olga Romanova, that have changed under Putin. Uh, their prisons are no longer divided into red ones run by the Federal Penitentiary Service and black ones run by thieves. The world of thieves has merged with the world of the bosses. Chakro Molodogo is linked to the head of the investigative committee. And uh, again, I'm still not sure what I'm looking at here, but maybe I should copy that and, and search that. Sh is is uh, Chakro Molodogo, first of all, I can't tell you whether that's being pronounced correctly, is that, let's, let's see what it is. And uh, all right, the Wikipedia entry here says, okay, uh, that, that the, the guy's real name 
Yes, is Zakari 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 like Zakari Kalashov, and uh, Young Chakro is his nickname, and I guess that's Molodogo. If I'm pronouncing that word correctly, that's what it means young. So, all right, there you go. Uh, I would say that was cleared up, except this is so disjointed that uh, I can't be certain that that's the case. All right. Uh, so anyway, the world of thieves has merged with the world of the bosses. The Chakro Malodigo and, and the bosses here, I guess, not the crime bosses, but the actual supposedly legitimate government bosses is what they mean, I think. Yeah, uh, because we've, well, I, I hope that's what it means because it would confirm all my priors, right? We keep saying here on the show that, the weird and dangerous and hard to understand but necessary to understand thing about Russia is that there's this merger between organized crime and legitimate government. And, uh, of course, it's not that legitimate. The world of thieves has merged with the world of the bosses. Chakro Molodigo is linked to the head of the investigative committee, Alexander Batrykin, Bastrykin, maybe. Uh, they are one gang, she says. Uh, it's worth mentioning here, Chris says parenthetically, that the armed forces have been deeply infiltrated by criminal gangs. And we seem to sometimes have that problem here as well, to the point that some gangsters have actually lived on military bases and extorted the soldiers there with the connivance of corrupt officers. Easier to believe now that we had received word some weeks ago that corrupt officers were allowing conscripted draftees to stay home instead of actually reporting to their units in exchange for kicking back half of their pay to these corrupt officers. So these corrupt officers are also able to extort money from people who do show up and end up on the base. So you're going to get taken one way or the other. You might as well stay home. Although a number of prominent thieves-in-law have died in the war, Romanova says some are not fighting and have used the opportunity to es legally escape. These are people from organized crime groups and with money. There's nothing to prevent someone with that kind of money from making a deal with the head of the prison and Prigozhin to be recorded as enlisted and then hole up in the mountains of Chechnya. And it's not for nothing that Prigozhin and Kadyrov had a good relationship. And that's the end of the thread is a source given here but it's a russian language source so it's of no use to me but it's kind of interesting uh once you open the door to that kind of close connection and corruption between the government and organized crime yeah uh, yeah that will affect your war readiness just a little bit right uh, how many troops do we have i don't know because there are corrupt officials, many of whom are kicking their profits up to you in order to be able to continue to do this, Mr. Putin. I can't count it. I don't know how many troops we have. I don't know what our troop strength is because none of the counts can be trusted because they're trading accurate counts for rubles and there seems to be no stopping them. So that's kind of interesting. Good way to have your uh, government and your ability to act like a government fall apart completely. So there you go. All right, let's see. Other things I wanted to catch up on. As I, as we left yesterday, we just sort of uh, put this story on the record. Of, or was it on Thursday or maybe on Wednesday? Yeah, that we uh, that I snuck in the story of Judge Terry Dowdy down in Louisiana being the conduit through which uh, the Trump forces were able to get themselves a temporary uh, halt to which one of the uh, Biden administration policies? It was, oh yes, right, the uh, 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 prohibiting the federal government from communicating with the uh, tech giants and social media services to get them to accept their suggestions anyway, or to even listen to their suggestions about what content might prove troublesome, dangerous, or a risk to national security. And Joan has written it up under, I think, uh, a headline that really hits the nail on the head here. Trump-appointed judge injects some QAnon into the federal judiciary. Because at this point, yeah, anybody's still buying into the original interpretation of the so-called Twitter files 
is kind of living in QAnon world. The whole thing has been pretty well debunked, but it's an article of faith among the right, including the people fighting with one another in the Freedom Caucus and Murdery Trader Green, etc., uh, that uh, no, those things aren't fake. They're actually true. And so therefore, we're now going to start making uh, decisions in the federal judiciary based on the assumption that those things are true when they're not. The MAGA QAnon crowd celebrated Independence Day with one of their own, a federal district court judge in Louisiana who issued a broad injunction against President Joe Biden and a bunch of his administration officials from working with social media companies to combat disinformation. Judge Terry Doty, uh, and again, probably mispronouncing the name, but D-O-U-G-H-T-Y, you'll find it in any of these stories, A Trump appointee himself ruled that the administration likely violated the First Amendment by censoring online free speech about the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020 election, and Hunter Biden's laptop. It's pretty QAnon-y. Doughty spared no hyperbole in his opinion. If the allegations made by plaintiffs are true, and you should find that out, the present case arguably involves the most massive attack against free speech in United States history. In their attempts to suppress alleged disinformation, the federal government, and particularly the defendants named here, are alleged to have blatantly ignored the First Amendment's right to free speech. It's a hell of a lot of work if is doing there. More quotes. Although this case is still relatively young, at this stage the court is only examining in terms of plaintiff's likelihood of success on the merits, temporary restraining order type uh, of motion here, He capitalizes his own court, which you're not supposed to do. That's supposed to be reserved for the Supreme Court. But anyway, uh, the evidence produced thus far depicts an almost dystopian scenario, Doughty writes. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a period perhaps best characterized by widespread doubt and uncertainty, the United States government seems to have assumed a role similar to an Orwellian Ministry of Truth. Many, perhaps, even the most would consider the pandemic a time of mass death. Yes, Uh, that wasn't part of his quote, of course. That was just reaction to it. The defendants are everyone from President Joe Biden on down, including whole executive branch agencies, the Departments of Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, Justice, Commerce, State and Treasury, as well as their directors. The list includes the entire FBI, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Food and Drug Administration, Census Bureau, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and dozens of individuals in all of these departments and agencies. Oh, and White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, because she clearly is part of the deep state decision-making process. They're all barred from flagging dangerous or problematic posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Google, and many other social media sites. To get a sense of how out there this judge is, the notoriously extreme Fifth Circuit has already rebuked him several times over his efforts to force Biden officials to testify, including former Press Secretary Jen Psaki, uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Director Jen Easterly, and White House Director of Digital Strategy Rob Flaherty. In the case of Saki, Pasaki, <laughs> I don't remember how you pronounce it, but I think in the case of Saki, the appeals court judges wrote, as press secretary, Saki's role was to inform the media of the administration's priorities, not to develop or execute policy. Unsurprisingly, then, the record does not demonstrate that Saki has unique firsthand knowledge that would justify the extraordinary measure of deposing a high ranking executive official. Dowdy also blocks agencies and officials from collaborating, coordinating, partnering, switchboarding, whatever that means, and or jointly working with groups including the Election Integrity Partnership, researchers led by the Stanford Internet Observatory, and the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public to identify problematic social media posts. These organizations are working on Internet safety, elections protection, and public health. The Stanford Group, for example, is studying how to prevent the sexual abuse and exploitation of children online 
And now the FBI and the Department of Justice are being blocked by this judge from working with that group, even though Yargle Bargle, sex trafficking, save the children. That's just one of the dangers in this sweeping injunction, the chilling effect it could have for law enforcement trying to fight criminal or terrorist activity. Dowdy is still follow, allowing the government to contact the companies about posts that detail crimes or national security threats or foreign attempts to influence elections, but the guidance he offered on what these exemptions covered is pretty unclear. The case was brought by Republican attorneys general in Missouri and Louisiana, fed by all the big lies that have been concocted by the far right in the past decade. To get a sense of what's behind this challenge and this decision, here's Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey in an interview conducted with the Washington Post before the injunction was issued. And I guess the quote here, the deep state planted a seed of suppression of government censorship. What, a suppression of government censorship? By government censorship, I guess is what he means, but that's pretty funny. But that seed was fertilized, germinated, and grew rapidly once President Biden took office. <laughs> Not Trump, sure. That's when the play seed was planted. But uh, for some reason, it didn't uh, matter until Biden took over. There are deep concerns here that the government's unrepentant attitude demonstrates a willingness to continue to violate the First Amendment. A White House official told the Post the Justice Department is reviewing the court's injunction and will evaluate its options in this case. They've already appealed. This administration has promoted responsible actions to protect public health, safety, and security when confronted by challenges like a deadly pandemic and foreign attacks on our elections, the official said. Our consistent view remains that social media platforms have a critical responsibility to take account of the effects that their platforms are having on the American people, but make independent choices about how the information uh, are about the information they present. So, all right, well, that's the bottom line of it. But uh, yeah, pretty interesting just how, like, I thought the point was well made really up, up in the headline in particular that what's happening here is the QAnonization of the federal judiciary, which is exactly what you worried about with Trump appointees. Very often they're level-headed people, as it turns out in the end, but uh, it doesn't have to happen all that often in order for it to be a problem that they turn out to be QAnon wackadoodles and rule based on something like that. That, uh, you know, that they believe the QAnon stories that there's a deep state conspiracy of some kind and you can't flag medical misinformation during a pandemic because, oh, everyone should have the freedom to be able to tell people to eat horse paste and drink bleach. That's just basic First Amendment Good manners, really, more than anything else. So he's issuing a nationwide injunction based on that. Never mind the fact that it would probably also hinder uh, federal investigations into the very child sex trafficking they claim to be so concerned about all the time. Uh, what do you know? They're gimmitarian hypocrites. Uh, breaking news, everybody. Okay, let's see. Other stories to share. Oh, this one I'm going to have to click on to figure out which one this is. Oh, yes. Uh, hmm. Uh, this one was offered up. I think Scott sent me this piece from Salon in answer to his interesting questions about. So the 303 creative case turns out that they made up the story about being contacted about a same sex couple who wanted a website in the first place. What can you do about this? And does it allow any opportunity to reopen the case in some way? And the answer is, strictly speaking, with respect to the case, no. <clears throat> Although I guess the Supreme Court can pretty much do whatever they want and no one can stop them. There's no indication that they want to reopen the case itself per se. But according to this article in Salon, legal scholars say that the SCOTUS can't be forced to reconsider this made-up case. But the lawyers in the case could be punished. That's a possibility. Uh, Reba Shah has written this up for, uh, well, it says, uh, I guess it's labeled here as a salon piece, uh, though it's brought to me through a link to MSNBC or MSN.com anyway that Scott sent along. So let's read through it. 
Just so you know what we know now, legal scholars pushed back on former acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal's claim that the Supreme Court may be compelled to re-examine a recent case after evidence surfaced that the claim at the heart of the case may have been fabricated. In the federal lawsuit filed preemptively seven years ago by Laurie Smith, the graphic artist cited a request from a man who says he never asked to work with her, according to the Associated Press. You know the background to that. But Smith cited a man named Stewart in 2017 court documents, including a website service request from him, which detailed his phone number and email address. When Melissa Gira Grant, a writer for the New Republic, contacted Stewart, uh, very enterprising of her, but admittedly seven years down the road, he said that no such thing had happened. Stewart told the outlet that he was not gay, had been married to a woman for 15 years, and is a web designer himself. The Supreme Court on Friday, last Friday, ruled in favor of the Christian web designer in Littleton, Colorado, who argued that free speech protections allowed her to reject designing wedding websites for same-sex couples. And we really do need to, I needed to get a clearer picture of the the the, the posture of the case. But as I understand it, uh, she wanted not only to be able to preemptively reject requests from same-sex couples, but she wanted to be able to, and this is where she ran afoul of the Colorado law, wanted to be able to put up on her website notice to them, I will not take your work. And that's a discriminatory message, and that's what ran afoul of the law. And as it turns out, it didn't really matter in terms of challenging the law whether or not she had ever gotten a request, but it did matter to trial judges at the outset in the in the state courts first looking at this thing and saying, well, do you have standing here? Do you, 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 no one has ever asked you to design one of these websites, so we can't find any injury in fact. And no one's punishing you for not taking any such uh, work requests because you haven't refused any yet. And so the next day, she came up with a story that says, well, actually, I have been asked and I did reject it. And here's the story. So it kind of it got around early questions about standing. But then eventually in the case, the state of Colorado in defending their law agreed to stipulate to all the facts as alleged by uh, the defendant because they were just pretty sure that the law stood on its own. As it turns out, they were pre wrong about that and also could have saved themselves some headaches by having the whole case dismissed on standing grounds early on, but they stipulated to the existence of this Stewart person as real. All right. So the Supreme Court, of course, ruled on Friday that, and this is a simplification of the, that story, that free speech protections allowed her to reject designing wedding websites. They also, she was claiming, allowed her to put up a message preemptively discriminating against same-sex couples on her website. Katyal suggested that the Supreme Court should revisit the ruling given the evidence. The question really is, can you make them? And the answer is, you can't make them do anything. The Supreme Court, though, he says, has a procedure to seek a rehearing. So to say... Hey, Supreme Court, there's a new fact that emerged and we need you to revisit the ruling. That's possible. The Supreme Court can also on its own ask for a briefing on this new question on whether this case is made up, Kat Yell told MSNBC. Then, let's see, uh, fraud. Oh, this is, I can't tell whether this is uh, a related issue. Mm, okay. Conservatives right now are defending the decision saying that Roe v. Wade, in Roe v. Wade, Roe wasn't pregnant at the time of the decision, and that's different, he continued. Remember, Greg brought this up because he was saying uh, Republicans were making this uh, claim. Well, uh, Roe wasn't pregnant at the time of the de decision of Roe v. Wade, and so therefore she never had standing. But again, pregnancy is something that resolves itself one way or another long before the case makes its way through to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said it's just a totally different kind of circumstance here. Of course, it doesn't moot the case that she is either 
received an abortion or given birth or whatever the outcome of this pregnancy was. That that can't be enough to moot the moot the ability of the court to reach this case. Otherwise, there'll never actually be an abortion decision ever made. So, um, so as he says, that was different. Roe was pregnant at the time of the filing of the complaint. So she was having the exact problem that she was trying to remedy, namely seeking an abortion because she was pregnant. Here, this web designer had never once done a website for an LGBT couple. It's the exact opposite situation, and it's totally hypothetical and made up. I think the Colorado Attorney General should consider bringing a rehearing petition before the U.S. Supreme Court. But legal scholars pushed back on Katyal's argument. I think this is a non-starter, said former U.S. Attorney Barb McQuaid, a University of Michigan law professor, the court glossed over standing in this case because a plaintiff is permitted to make a facial challenge to a law on the ground that yet violates the First Amendment. If the allegations about fabrication are true, then the lawyers may have an ethics problem to address with their state bar, but it will not affect the outcome of the case, McQuaid added. Leah Littman, a law professor at the University of Michigan, told Salon that parties are free to file a motion for reconsideration or rehearing, but ultimately it will be up to the court to decide whether to do anything about it. Attorneys are subject to judicial discipline and discipline from bar organizations if they lie to the court, Littman said. Longtime Harvard constitutional scholar Lawrence Tribe told Salon that Katyal certainly knows that no state attorney general has any such authority, adding that he doesn't take Katya literally when he suggests that, but it would be a mistake to let that obscure the central fact that the entire case was based on entirely hypothetical worries that the web designer claimed to have about how the state's officers might come after her under the state anti-discrimination laws if a same-sex couple were to ask her to design a wedding site for them and if she were to refuse. Tribe said, in my view, the disgraceful fact, which in no way depends on the falsity of the allegations about the fellow who supposedly asked Laurie Smith to design a website for a same-sex wedding, is the very fact that the Supreme Court's majority was willing to render what amounted to an advisory opinion that it would never have done but for its eagerness to denigrate same-sex marriage and LGBTQ rights generally, and that under Article 3 it had no business doing. Yes, uh, that's the part about there needing to be a case or controversy. They, there's an explicit prohibition on the Supreme Court issuing advisory opinions. Not all state Supreme Courts have the same prohibition, according to their state constitutions, by the way. But you're not supposed to say, well, hypothetically, if this were to happen and that were to happen, what should the law be? Now, you're supposed to wait for an actual case or controversy. That's in the Constitution in Article 3. In 303 Creative LLC versus Elenis, uh, Smith claimed that the state anti-discrimination law prevented her from entering the wedding website business. The law would not allow her to publish a message on her website that let her express her religious beliefs. The statement read, I will not be able to create websites for same-sex marriages or any other marriage that is not between one man and one woman. Doing that would compromise my Christian witness and tell a story about marriage that contradicts God's true story of marriage, the very story he is calling me to promote. That's what she wanted her website to say. That was the effect that she wanted it to have. And Colorado's anti-discrimination law says you're not really supposed to be doing that. That was the issue. Is it okay to do it because it's a religious message or not? Justice Neil Gorsuch, writing on behalf of the majority, stated that a lower court had determined a reasonable assumption based on Colorado's actions in previous cases involving same-sex marriages. The majority of the court concluded that the state of Colorado could not legally require her to create websites that conveyed messages conflicting with her belief that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. Sherilyn Eiffel, former president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, said that the claim in the case is potential fraud on the court, which warrants investigation, potential vacateur, vacateur, vacator, really, is uh, 
I think that's right. Vacay. I'm just trying to think back to law school days. But it looks like something foreign sounding, but it really, it's vacator. Vacating the case, d- dismissing it, mooting it. Uh, and disciplinary proceedings as well, by the way. It should also be seen as a consequence of the court's apparent zeal to hear this case, which did not meet standing even without the fraud, Eiffel tweeted. In another tweet, she added that attorneys are prohibited by ethical and procedural rules from making misrepresentations to the court. If this story about Stuart was made up by her lawyers in the briefs or in arguments, it's a serious issue. And it is. And... Uh, Not serious enough, though, for me to remember to play our music at the right time. So we'll exit in an odd spot in the music, but uh, cut ourselves off at uh, two seconds past the uh, the 208 minute, regardless. Anyway, okay, so you know, that'll screw things up a little bit for the editing, but there you have it. <clears throat> now you have an answer. Uh, I assume that uh, you all felt that the, the, those options were closed off in the first place. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the k in the morning show here on net roots radio this is where we have to come back in a different spot in the music okay so to expand a little bit on the q anani ish way in which judge doty ruled in that uh, social media case i have uh well i, I told you there were comments in one or another of the articles, both from Leah Littman, I think, and Lawrence Tribe. And they got together and wrote a piece for Just Security about it. And you know how things can be on Just Security. They get very weedy and detailed. But this will help you understand, I think, the, I hope, I hope it doesn't get too jargony, the uh, wider implications. And you'll see just how crazy this idea is. Um well, uh, in its own right, but the fact that it also stands on rather a QAnon view of the world is disturbing on a different level. But just on the merits of the case, on July 4th, federal judge Terry A. Doughty should have been taking the day off in the Western District of Louisiana issued a preliminary injunction in Missouri versus Biden, a case that basically turns some elected Republicans fixations on social media censorship into legal reality. That's the real scary part of it is now the federal bench, at least in part, is behind the idea that, oh, we're all being shadow banned and they're doing this to us because we're conservative and yargle bargle. And as it turns out, I mean, the censorship because you're conservative is because conservatism demands of you now, thanks to Trump, that you spend your time on social media saying things like, eat hydroxychloroquine, drink your fish tank, eat the horse paste, drink bleach, inject bleach in directly into your lungs, put a light bulb where, you know, everything else don't shine, what have you. And it's dangerous and kooky and stupid. But it's also about, well, the election was stolen and there are Jewish space lasers that are controlling everything. And so, you know, uh, only conservatives go in for that. 
But that translates to, you're censoring me because I'm conservative. No, I'm censoring you because you're crazy and dangerous. You're conservative because that's the place where crazy people and dangerous people are comfortable. That's the difference. But that's not what Leah Littman and Lawrence Tribe are here to tell you. That's I, I had to add that one. Okay, the impetus behind the case is now the, the now thoroughly debunked conspiracy theory that the government is somehow strong-arming big tech into censoring conservative speech and speakers in violation of the First Amendment. By the way, you should probably look at this. Now this, now this juxtaposition makes sense. It didn't before. It was not my plan to make it make sense. But uh, how... I guess, how crazy is it to believe that big tech is being strong-armed by the government when, in fact, we just read stories about what's actually going on here is big tech is strong-arming governments. They're not strong-arming this one yet, but I guess they will if Amy Klobuchar has her way and passes this bill. They'll try and do the same. We're going to cut you off from all news coverage. You're not allowed to read the news online anymore. All right, well... Uh, if they're strong-arming Canada, it must really be the case that it's the opposite. The United States government is strong-arming them into what? Into not telling people that crazy Republican conspiracy theories are valid and should be understood as viable alternatives. While, uh, while there are, in theory, interesting questions about when and how the government can try to jawbone private entities to remove speech from their platforms, this decision doesn't grapple with any of them. In fact, from the 155-page opinion, it's not even clear this case really raises those questions. Each step in the reasoning of the decision manages to be more outlandish than the last, from the idea that the plaintiffs have standing to the notion that the plaintiffs are entitled to an injunction at this stage of the case to the sweep of the injunction that the district court issued. But the absurdity of different aspects of the decision in Missouri versus Biden should not obscure the bigger picture of what happened. Invoking the First Amendment, the, a single district court judge effectively issued a prior restraint on large swaths of speech, cutting short an essential dialogue between the government and social media companies about online speech and its potentially lethal misinformation. Compounding that error, the district court crafted its injunction to apply to myriad high-ranking officials in the Biden administration, raising grave separation of powers concerns. And equally troubling is how the court's order, which prevents the government from even speaking with tech companies about their content moderation policies, deals a huge blow to vital government efforts to harden U.S. democracy against threats of misinformation. First, though, the legal missteps in the opinion. Identifying the opinion's many legal errors would require a lengthy article, so we'll just note a few and make it sort of lengthy. First, Bypassing standing, the new hobby horse of the right here. One error is whether the plaintiffs in the case even have standing, i.e., once again, whether the plaintiffs have established a sufficient risk of future injury to them that is attributable to the government's conduct being challenged here. As the case caption suggests, the plaintiffs in Missouri include several Republican-led states as well as private individuals, including the owner and operator of the Gateway Pundit website. Take the Republican-leaning states, which have no apparent stake in this case beyond the generalized interest they say their citizens have in posting and reading disinformation. States lack standing to just assert the interests of their citizens, so the district court was forced to assert that the Republican-leaning states nonetheless had standing because they were, quote, being excluded from the benefits intended to arise from participation in the federal system. What? Apparently, the Constitution is intended to secure to the states the benefits of existing in a cesspool of disinformation about election denialism and COVID, or so the district court would have it if this opinion stands. And that's to say nothing about whether the plaintiff's injuries are caused by the conduct being challenged, namely the government meeting with social media companies about misinformation. 
As the court goes on to say, it's not clear the social media companies would have chosen to keep the misinformation on their platforms without the government's involvement. But if that's right, then the plaintiff's supposed injuries weren't caused by the conduct they're challenging. And they're also not redressable by an injunction barring the government from communicating with social media companies. Botching the standing analysis isn't just a theoretical or formalistic error. The Constitution only gives federal courts the power to consider cases that actually involve disputes, also known as cases or controversies, and to redress actual injuries. If the plaintiffs lack standing, the federal court is supposed to dismiss the case full stop. Then, of course, there's the misapplying of the First Amendment. Another serious misstep in the opinion occurred when the court analyzed whether this case involves First Amendment violations that require an injunction. Just to reiterate, there are may, there may be circumstances where the government runs afoul of the First Amendment by effectively forcing private companies to remove protected speech, or for that matter, forcing those companies to say what they don't believe. But the district court's analysis does not even purport to seriously engage with issues, the issue of when that might occur. Instead, the opinion seems to maintain that the government cannot even politely ask companies not to publish verifiable misinformation. But you should remember underlying all of this, the Republican position in this is that, you know, it's just one of those situations where you do something like, well, I'm going to go on Facebook and publish that, uh, you know, whatever the claims like about hydroxychloroquine, for instance, or that uh, um, uh, any of the other false claims, take anything you want, whether it was the election or COVID or whatever, I'm going to put that up there. And when the companies say it's our policy not to allow that, and the government flags that because they're, you know, they have a public health interest in getting the right information out there and they flag it and they say, what do you say? This violates your own rules. Shouldn't this be removed? And they remove it. And then Republicans pull the old ploy of, oh, they're censoring me because I'm conservative. But again, they're censoring you because what you're saying is wrong and dangerous and detrimental to the public health. And the public health authorities in the United States recognize it as such and point it out to the social media platform, which says, yeah, we have an interest in promoting public health too. Our policies are the ones that say, remove this stuff. But again, they go around saying, I'm having my material censored just because I'm a Republican, but it doesn't have anything to do with your being a Republican. But that's what they like to say. And so they bring this to the court and this court is basically saying, yes, it is happening because you're a Republican. Therefore, it is protected that's i need that assumption to be in place so that i can say protected first amendment speech is being targeted here now protected first amendment speech normally for regular people is things like i support donald trump for president even though i would say now that is currently under the certain circ- under the current circumstances where he's charged with espionage for instance plus his penchant for disinformation it's a bad example But if you say something like, uh, I always thought Ronald Reagan was an excellent president and I therefore support conservative values in the next upcoming election, that's obviously protected First Amendment speech. It's your political opinion. It's about supporting a candidate. It's about supporting a candidate who has not, by consensus, been declared to be, uh, you know, engaged in espionage or anything like that. It's just normal, regular, everyday political discourse. And to suggest to, you know, if the government were in the business of suggesting to Facebook and Twitter that that sort of thing ought to be taken down, you would have a problem. But so step one in the sort of wish casting here is you got to have a a plaintiff like the, you know, disingenuous people like Gateway Pundit or any Republican elected official at this point who will say, oh, it really has nothing to do with the content of my speech. It was really because I was a, I'm a Republican and you are not a Republican. And so you want to suppress my speech. But what we want to suppress is the dangerous medical misinformation or the dangerous lies about the way the election was counted in the end, which was 
been taken to court 60 times and lost, you're just, I mean, eventually at some point you have to admit, look, the courts speak for the for for us here. Uh, it's an established fact because every court that's touched it has kept finding that you're wrong about this. I know you think you're right, but suppressing you from continuing to insist that this was the actual case and that no one ought to take the legitimacy of the Biden administration seriously is dangerous and undermining. And we'd like to see a stop put to it. It's not because you're a Republican that you're saying it. It's because you're crazy, although that, too, is beginning to change. Republicans are being required to say crazy things, even crazy things they don't believe, in order to remain Republicans in good standing. But no, two very different kinds of speech here and the same swap, you know, bait and switch game that admittedly many people in many parts of the political spectrum often do. They say, uh, oh, well, it's usually things like, oh, my, uh, uh, this is film of somebody being like, for instance, uh, they're arrested for just because they are, you know, whatever, name your either, whether it's a minority racial issue or because they are protesting against a, a war. And then you find out, well, you know, they're actually on security cameras, uh, you know, vandalizing something earlier on. And that's why they're being picked up. It's not racial profiling. It's they saw you do this thing or it's not uh, in a, a uh, insane hatred for war protesters uh, because of their political disagreements with them, but that they saw them, you know, either commit some crime or and sometimes, of course, it's not. And it's all fabricated there. Don't get me wrong. That happens probably more often than anything else. But yeah, uh, when you then tell the story that uh, simply because I was protesting the war or simply because I'm black or simply because I'm Latino, I was targeted. Maybe, yes, that does happen. But when you do everyone a disservice when you, you know, bait and switch that stuff and say, this is a racial discrimination case rather than a case of my having been caught doing something. And here, same thing with the Republicans. Oh, it's because I'm conservative. No, it's because you've been caught doing something. But back to the experts here. Start with the pandemic. The introduction of, to the opinion announces that the purpose of the free speech clause of the First Amendment is, quote, to preserve an uninhibited marketplace of ideas rather than to countenance monopolization of the market, whether it be by the government itself or private licensee. Well, that's a different kind of view of things. To support that proposition, the district court cited Red Lion Broadcasting Company, a case where the Supreme Court upheld the Federal Communication Commission's decision to require a private entity, a radio company, to provide airtime to persons who were criticized in a previous broadcast. That decision, far from supporting the district court's, district court's peculiar ruling, points in the opposite direction. It supports the government's authority to regulate speech and indeed to compel speech on private platforms in certain circumstances. There's also considerable precedent that recognizes that the government can ask private parties to remove content. That precedent exists for a reason. If it didn't, the government couldn't communicate with private parties about their content moderation policies or whether, hypothetically, Foreign governments were trying to make certain content go viral in order to reduce voter turnout or inflame divisions or make the country less safe. There are myriad legitimate and indeed compelling reasons for the government to ask social media companies to remove content. And the First Amendment certainly doesn't prevent them from merely asking to treat the First Amendment as creating something like a wall of separation between the government and powerful private actors is utterly bizarre. It would turn the Constitution's protection of free expression in an open society into an obstacle course for some of the most valuable exchanges of information and ideas we can imagine. The district court cited all the precedent supporting this public-private dialogue before cavalierly dismissing it, in part by declaring that, quote, what is really telling is that virtually all of the free speech suppressed was, quote, conservative free speech, 
Ah, now we get the bait and switch. As if the cases supported the government, all of a sudden didn't matter, supporting the government, that supported the government, all of a sudden didn't matter because this case involves conservatives, you see. There's your gimmitarianism, right? All of the things that say the government is allowed to do this doesn't matter because we're being hurt. So therefore, dismiss it all. One side note, he says parenthetically, several of the allegations in the complaint occurred during the Trump administration. Communications between social media companies and government officials happen no matter who's in power. And the First Amendment is not supposed to lean left or right. There is also the fact that the district court made no effort to identify circumstances where the government came even close to coercing social media companies into doing something they didn't want to do. Take the allegations concerning hydroxychloroquine. On pages 52 and 53 of the opinion, the district court recites the very serious allegation that the Department of Health and Human Services, quote, suppressed speech on hydroxychloroquine. How'd they do it? By having Dr. Anthony Fauci make statements on Good Morning America. Where's my button for that? Yes, the dramatic music comes out. Why, he went on Good Morning America and on Andrea Mitchell Reports and said that hydroxychloroquine is not effective. Well, it isn't. The next sentence then reports that after this apparently very coercive Good Morning America appearance, quote, social media platforms censored, unquote, videos and material that were pro-hydroxychloroquine. That must have been quite the Good Morning America appearance. But joking aside, a government official appearing on a television show and stating that certain speech is disinformation does not even come remotely close to the government coercing social media companies into removing that speech. More generally, the district court's theory seems to be that tech companies were coerced to, simp to take action simply by virtue of having meetings with the government. No, really, on page 93... Parenthetically, the court declares that, quote, defendants used meetings and communications with social media companies, unquote, and, quote, flagged posts and provided information, unquote, about concerning posts. Yeah, so we're meant to find that shocking. Apparently, the district court even maintained that it doesn't matter what the decision the social media company would have made, but whether the decision is essentially that of the government. What does that even mean? If the social media companies would have removed the speech no matter what the government did, then the government did not coerce anyone into doing anything. And the social media company's decision wouldn't be those of the government's. There are difficult questions out there about when messages on license plates, say, or in the pronouncements of agricultural industry associations, I guess there's two examples linked here. Constitute government speech as opposed to private speech. Suffice it to say, this case doesn't remotely pose such questions. Now, as to granting this injunction, if we had to choose, the most egregious facet of the decision would probably be the breathtaking scope of the district court's order. The injunction would, ice, uh, would insulate social media companies from criticism about their content moderation policies not just from coercion. The district court blithely announces that it, quote, believes that an injunction can be narrowly tailored to only affect prohibited activities, unquote, but then goes on to issue an injunction that does no such thing. Among other things, the district court's order prohibits the myriad government defendants from emailing, calling, sending letters, texting, or engaging in any communication of any kind with social media companies urging, encouraging, pressuring, or inducing in any manner for removal, deletion, suppression, or reduction of content containing protected free speech. It also prevents government defendants from meeting with social media companies about the same. They are not allowed to flag certain content or posts or notify companies to be on the lookout for certain posts. Nothing in the Supreme Court's recent decision in United States v. Hansen, which upheld a federal law discouraging unauthorized immigration, supports this result. Hansen interpreted the federal statute to prohibit only the purposeful solicitation of specific acts that violate federal immigration laws. And who are the government defendants that are enjoined from communicating or meeting with social media companies? 
That's where things get even crazier. The district court wrote in its injunction to include the Department of State, all of it, and the Department of Homeland Security, all of that one too. Oh, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. It calls to mind the Chief Justice's accusation from the Texas SB8 case argued last term that the United States was, quote, seeking an injunction against the world. There is no shortage of errors in this opinion, which is trying to make the infamous Twitter files into constitutional law. That's the heart of it. That's what we really are getting at, and especially in Jones' uh, headline about it, the QAnon being injected into federal law. Who knows whether the equally infamous U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit will correct any of these mistakes, though at least this past term, even the Supreme Court found that the Fifth Circuit's antics went too far on several occasions. Whatever ultimately happens in this case shouldn't cause us to lose sight of the fact that this decision, if left standing, will make us less secure as a nation and will endanger us all every day that the injunction remains in force. So I thought there was some helpful detail on all of this and uh, pointing at the different levels at which, A, the case should have been stopped but wasn't, and then proceeding on to the next. He has to make these crazy logical leaps that get wider and wider with each step towards issuing the injunction. And you should also keep in mind, I didn't really talk about it very much, but uh, a temporary injunction to to, uh, put that in place, the standard that the judge has to uh, adhere to here and it could also be reversible error if he doesn't, is that he has to show that the plaintiffs do have a reasonable chance of success eventually on the merits of the full case. It will enjoin the government from doing this thing even before there's a trial about whether or not they're doing this thing. But in order to get that kind of extraordinary relief, you have to show that there's a pretty good chance, better than not, that the plaintiffs actually will win their case. And given that even getting to the injunction stage requires these wild leaps in logic, it's probably not even really true that they have a substantive uh, chance of of, uh, winning at trial, except for the fact that he'll be handling the trial, which is a little stupid by itself. Of course, the Fifth Circuit might uphold them because they're crazy too, but they also did eventually say enough is enough to Eileen Cannon as well. So we'll see. But yeah, there's an awful lot tied up in this one. And uh, the, the bottom line is that the worst part of it is, yes, it's trying to um, recast QAnon theories, crazy QAnon conspiracy theories, as constitutional law in this country, which... We would all definitely have been pre-wrong about at some point. Okay, let's see. Are there any other things that I... There's definitely more things I wanted to squeeze in here. Are there any other things that I can squeeze in here? Probably not. But uh, let's see. Why don't I throw this one in here? Since we're speaking uh, of crazy QAnon theories being turned into law here. I'll just read you a little bit from Politico's report from the other day. Inside the House GOPS plan to go after the FBI and DOJ. We know all about their ideas of defunding this stuff, about impeaching various officials. Republicans, it says, are escalating a multi-pronged fight against their two biggest political boogeymen. And it goes far beyond just trying to impeach Attorney General Merrick Garland. Jordan Carney wrote this up on the 5th of July. I got just a minute or so to read to you before we uh, exit for the day and the week. House Republicans are taking their fight with the FBI and Justice Department to a new level, weighing punitive steps against both agencies that would have been unfathomable a decade ago. Half a year into their majority and with increasingly restless right flanks, uh, a right flank, the House GOP is ready for a confrontation after a spate of recent decisions it sees as either anti-Trump or pro-Biden. At the top of the list, Hunter Biden's plea deal with federal investigators and Donald Trump's indictment over his handling of classified documents. If you indict our man for the espionage he committed, we will defund you, is the basic uh, proposition here. That push against FBI and DOJ will become a cornerstone of Republicans' agenda in a chaotic back half of the year, Kevin McCarthy has already threatened to explore impeaching Merrick Garland. Conservatives have also gone after FBI Director Christopher Wray 
weighing whether to vote, uh, force a vote on recommending booting him from office. Additionally, some conservatives who believe the agencies have targeted Republicans are eager to cut the law agencies' budgets. Then there's the long-brewing congressional fight over a soon-to-expire warrantless surveillance program that has sparked bipartisan, suddenly, accusations of abuse by the FBI. That's what I wanted to get around to introducing. We're going to have to do one of those, we'll just have to leave it there, things. But what's essentially happening here is when 10, 15 years ago, uh, Democrats and progressives were telling you, well, maybe the Patriot Act and post 9-11 surveillance laws actually went a little bit too far. And one of these days, Republicans who all support it unanimously right now, you may find, and this is the problem with such things, you may find that the law enforcement agencies granted this powers overstepped their bounds. And instead of restricting their activities to tracking potential terrorist threats instead decide that you're the threat and maybe you actually are the threat and they should be investigating you but you will certainly feel like you're not the threat and consider whether or not this could ever backfire against you now of course they have a former president caught stealing classified documents among other things now guilty of, among other things, obstruction of justice I would, and, uh, and a violation of the Espionage Act, and who knows what else, but also his insurrection, his election lies, his COVID lies, his everything lies, his business lies, all of these things. Now the information being gathered that may, what under normal circumstances, would put him behind bars is considered to be, well, that's political targeting because he's, con you're doing it because he's conservative. No, we're doing it because he's a criminal, just like the last story that we read. But in addition, now they say, well, the intelligence and surveillance uh, information gathering techniques that you're using are too invasive and you shouldn't be allowed to do them. And, of course, this is where we all say, this is what we told you back then. But when you thought only brown people were going to be caught by it, you were fine with it. Though we told you equal application of the law means you'll be caught by it, too. And their response? Well, then, let's get rid of equal application of the law. Well, you know, it's kind of brilliant in its bluntness. There you have it. That's what they're up to. Now you know. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning. Waldman. Well, now time to hand things over to Justice Putnam, of course, for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. What's he going to lead off with? Even legal threats that have no standing to enforce the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling is enough to frighten universities from admitting students of color for having the backlash that everybody was worried about. He'll tell you all about that and more next.